So it's really great to be part of this. So um, what's the task? The task is essentially sinus disease in pediatrics in children. And um, so when I was putting this talk together, um, I was thinking how to, how, how to address this. Um, on the basis that I didn't want it to overlap with a lot of the other talks you've already had. On the ISCP, you can see lots of objectives, knowledge, etc. And there is absolutely no way I can cover all of that for you. So what we're going to focus on essentially is, you know, the obligatory learning outcomes at the start of the talk. So what I find personally, what I find personally a challenge in pediatric sinus disease is finding the cause and the best treatment pathway forward in very simple terms. That's the essence of management. And um, just the same way as when we're sort of doing APLS, you know, children are not small adults. They're not just a smaller version, lighter version of the, of the adult presentation. So we do have to think about it differently. So what this talk is about is trying to help you with the diagnostic pathway in inflammatory disease, nasal disease essentially in children. I'll just skim the surface of allergic rhinitis only to put it in the context of CRS. So it's not an AR talk. Give you a little bit of an idea of the evidence base. There's a recent EPOS, all 400 plus pages of which I'm sure you will have all have read cover to cover. Um, and really the crux of it is to try and help your decision making. Should you or should you not operate? Essentially, that's what I find it really comes down to when I'm thinking about these kids. So what this talk isn't is an endoscopic sinus surgery talk, not these. So um, as per Neil, uh, I think it's important to define what you do and where you do it. Um, so this lovely shiny building blue thing is the Royal London, which is part of Bart's. It's um, the children's hospital is sandwiched um, in three floors in the middle of that. Um, and down at the bottom here, you can see the old building. Um, the reason I put this on is not only to tell you what I do, which is essentially pediatrics and rhinology and pediatric rhinology, um, but also to say that when you come out of Whitechapel, which is where the Royal London is, um, you turn left and you see Tower Hamlets in Newham, which is the poorest borough uh, in the whole of the UK. And then you turn right and then you see the city, which is the richest borough in not just London, but the whole of the UK. And that makes for fantastic pathology of every description and really gives you some ch unique challenges for um, delivery of healthcare. So uh, a little bit about development of the sinuses and you can see, I, I remember, and um, it was very interesting hearing the previous talks. I remember when I was training and I said, oh, I'm interested in pediatrics and I'm interested in rhinology. And, and um, one of my trainers on the side, but there's no such thing as pediatric rhinology as a specialty. So, so I sort of carried that on with me. So it's interesting to be here. So essentially, I think it was because people didn't really give sinus disease very much thought in, in you know, years, gone, years gone by. So part of that is because the sinuses are much, much smaller and maybe as a result of that warranted less, less attention. But essentially, I'll put here big enough, by the age of four, you've got big enough sinuses to give you problems. And you can see on the right hand side of the screen that even at newborn, you will have some sinus of sorts. And by age of four, it's, it's big enough as it were. And by 12 to 15, you will have near adult sized sinuses, including your frontals and pneumatizing your sphenoids. So they're certainly big enough to give you problems. So what sort of sinus disease do we get in children? Generally speaking, we can keep that acute and uh, chronic definition going. And you can see that the divisions are whether it's four weeks or 12 weeks. There is an interesting role that is played by a dentition and you'll see that you'll get your permanent teeth by 11. So those of uh, us uh, who've had uh, braces, you will know they go on at about 12. That's because that's your adult dentition coming through. So um, we'll touch on acute uh, sinusitis, but essentially we're going to focus on the chronic side of things. So um, I don't know if you can see, Mira, the, the chat function. I, I always feel a little bit, it's difficult giving this talk because I kind of feel like I'm talking to myself um, and a very few people of the speakers who I can see nodding. Um, but I've put there as a presentation and um, if you didn't know that this was a sinus talk, um, just people don't have to write, but just so, you know, there's, there's sort of that sort of thinking about it. 
there is a very clear, very common pathology that that's describing, which is essentially a very adenoidal kid. So the real challenge, and I, the reason I've put that slide up there, all of these, by the way, there's no GDPR. There are slides of, you know, readily available on Google. So it's not a, any child in particular. Um, so the real challenge for, for us when we're seeing this sort of picture, nasal blockage, mouth breather, snotty kid, uh, green slugs coming from the nose, snoring, possible OSA, how much of this is in the nasal passage, uh, how much of that is contributed to by an allergic picture, and how much that is postnasal space, so the typical adenoid or child essentially. And in some ways, certainly for me personally, that's the greatest diagnostic conundrum. So in some ways, why do we worry about it? Why didn't we just sort of do an adenoidectomy, be done with it, and then, you know, if they're not better, then we sort of can think about other things. So just going back to this slide for a second. Um, so when we, when we are thinking about it, it's worthwhile to sort of break it down. Is it the nose? Is it the postnasal space? And the reason it's worth thinking about because of some of, the, some of the possible complications, and so that is why sinus disease in children is important. I put up their periorbital cellulitis. This is not a periorbital cellulitis talk, and obviously you can, you can uh, look at all the complications of say, periorbital cellulitis, etc. cetera. Um, but one of the things that where children and adults are different, I will highlight here, and that is that kids are not very good at uh, quantifying or qualifying the distress that sinus disease causes. So they very often will be adenoidal children younger at, at a younger age and will not be able to differentiate even in the clinical picture which of the uh, which of the two it is um, i've got a little boy um, who i'm looking after at the moment he is now five nearly six and he's a very very sad case because um, due to a domestic incident he had sustained some head trauma and as a result he is um, um, very much uh, disabled and is not able to express his issues and tends to hit his face when he's distressed. Um, the, the problem with that, of course, is those kids are not easy, well, any kid for that matter, is not easy to put a flexible nasal endoscope in, uh, not easy to scan, uh, and uh, that gives it, we give it a diagnostic um, uh, sort of conundrum. Added to which, if you've got a kid who's very snotty with all the green stuff coming out the front of their nose, that really does have an impact on how they are um, sort of integrating amongst their peers. They tend to be the snotty child that sort of wipes its, wipes its nose on, its, on his sleeve. So when we sort of think about true sinus disease in children, chronic sinus, sinusitis this is, it's important to think about it when it is not an infective cause or not straightforward infective cause and there's no other um, pathology going on that's one reason but of course there's lots of different and very common when you think about chronic sinusitis in the pediatric population causes for having uh, CRS uh, and I've listed the main ones for you and we'll sort of go through it um, one by one. The issue with all of them or rather the overriding issue with all of them is that you've got uh, stagnated thick mucus that gets recurrent infections and is very, very difficult to clear. That's the bottom line for all sorts of different reasons. So um, you can go from a, this sort of picture to that picture if you operate and that's not what you want to do. The reason I've put this up here, because very often these children with these sort of pathologies will at baseline, when they are well, have this sort of CT scan. So you, don't treat the CT uh, because you will never get that sinus CT back to normal. It is, it's a hiding to nothing. So this is just in a pictorial format depicting what the real issues are. So cystic fibrosis essentially, as you know, you've got the transport receptor membrane deficiency. In short, all that happens is that chloride doesn't flow out and you will have a very sticky mucus in your airways or in fact, or, or any, any organ that, you, that, will, that will be secreting water, whether it is in your biliary ducts or your epididymis, whatever that may be. And as a result, the secretions are very, very thickened. Young's is, is just a variation of CF when you've got male infertility. So the issue here is that everything works except your um, um, chloride receptor. In primary ciliary dyskinesia, which is a ciliopathy, 
essentially what happens, and if there's 30 different genetic variations, which you'll be glad to know we're not going to go through today. But essentially the problem is that the cilia do not work. So the motility is affected. So you've got these dynein arms, which if you can draw in your FRCS fiber, you're onto a winner. Um, but that tends to not work. And as a result, the cilia don't beat. So the constituent parts of the secreted, um, uh, nasal secretions rather, are normal. It's just that they don't move. And if they don't move, obviously they stagnate. So ABPA is allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. The reason I've put this here is that it's a different entity and, and behaves similarly, although due to a different pathology from PCD or CF. And essentially what happens, this is a truly IgE mediated disease. So it's an allergic disease, but what you get with it is essentially um, ongoing chronic infection, both in the lungs as well as in the nose. So the take home message from this is that although there are different um, uh, pathology causing each of these different subsets, the effect is, is that you've got mucus that just sticks around in your nose um, for, for, for a very, very long time. And once we appreciate that, then we know why that CT is never going to get back to normal, because essentially, as soon as you've cleared it, you, you're almost right back to where you started from. Um, so hopefully that is leading you to the conclusion that one should not be jumping into an operative in intervention in this patient group. Having said that, this is not an allergic rhinitis talk. I did just want to put this slide up for two reasons. Uh, reason number one is because you haven't had an allergic rhinitis talk. So it's and and in, in my very humble opinion, I think all of AR can be probably condensed into this one slide, uh, although I never like slides with arrows. Uh, and the second thing is just to appreciate that ABPA is an IG mediated disease. So it's important just to know that. You don't really have to remember any of these, even for FRCS. The only bits you have to remember essentially is that at your nasal mucosa, you um, inhale something, that uh, you're allergic to and that something can be timothy grass obviously most commonly in the uk uh, could be aspergillosis fumigatus uh, whatever choose your antigen of choice and when you've done so you pick it up in your t-cell which essentially gives you a bifurcating um, um, sort of uh, a downward stream and that is characterized by two main arms one is il4 mediated and essentially that primes your b cells to coat these naughty guys that are full of histamine in antibodies, uh, your IgE antibodies, which is why, and if you're looking at this slide, that's why it makes sense that we measure total IgE when we're doing RAS tests and specific IgE to whatever you think the person may be allergic to. It is the mast cell degranulation that gives you that sneezing and acute runniness. On the second arm, you have IL-5, which essentially triggers these naughty cells. So now you know why when we're doing a blood test, we actually do a total eosinophil count. So that's why you do an IgE, that's why you do your total eosinophil, is because essentially you're measuring the two arms to this pathway. This, all the eosinophilic pathways and some of these inflammatory uh, contents are what gives you the ongoing nasal congestion. So, so, that, so that's the only reason for this to be here. I will very quickly, again, this is not a talk on biofilms, but I will touch on this because it's very topical and very important when we think, why do you get a chronic inflammatory situation in, in these chronic rhinus sinusitis? And essentially all that happens is that you've got these bacteria, Staph aureus typically, that attach itself to the surface. Um, and if you've got a fantastic, uh, sort of almost like a Petri dish that they can grow in, such as nasal secretions, they do so. And they keep on seeding. And some of the recent studies have shown that you can actually find Staph aureus intracellularly um, underneath your epithelium. And I won't bore you to tears with the fact that those protective mechanisms, uh, connections between your epithelial cells and your, in the nose are also not holding quite as tight as they should. So there is an ongoing issue about having a biofilm full of, uh, of, of pathogenic bacteria. And they are able to some degree evade both your innate and your adaptive immunity. You don't have to remember any of those cells, you'll be happy to hear. So 
summarizing some of the EPOS findings, and I think, to be honest, this slide is all you will need to know when you're thinking about the, about, uh, the EPOS relevance to, um, to, to the pediatric CRS. And you can read that, you can read that yourself. I think the most important things to appreciate in that is that there is no definitive causal relationship between allergic rhinitis and CRS. That smoking or parental smoking, obviously not the child, uh, is important and that is really, really worthwhile thinking about the adenoids because if you've got uh, this pathogenic bacteria, which essentially is your, is your biofilm on, on all those secretions, then there is a benefit to thinking about taking that out, not least that you will actually improve uh, the nasal airway. So those are the, the takeaway points from that. So, so what do you take into account when you're thinking, shall I or shall I not operate? And you can see there some of, some of the issues. So for example, for my, for my part, the age and the instrument goes hand in hand. If you get very, very small children, A, the sinuses are smaller, definitely, and some of your instruments just don't fit. So there is, that's one of the issues, number, number one of the first issues. By ENT disease, I mean adenoids. By atopy, I mean allergic rhinitis. Could some of the symptoms that you're seeing be attributable to that? Because the two can, can obviously coexist. CT scan, how easy it is to scan that child, and obviously the comorbidity. As I say, I have a very, very high threshold for, to, for operating in children with coexistent uh, airways disease. If you operate, obviously make sure that your instruments fit. Consider how optimized the underlying condition is. Please think about the repeated CT scanning of, of the kids uh, and post-operative treatment. And I, indeed, you should really be thinking about pre-op treatment as well with regards to uh, topical uh, medication. And I put in here type of endoscopic sinus surgery. Um, how limited do you do it? And I would argue for uh, a limited approach as opposed to, uh, you know, this is, you know, just like Neil, this is not a let's hunt for the CSF type uh, endoscopic surgery by all means. Okay. So I suppose it's a balance in, in, a, in, a, in a summary. It's a balance. I think you have to take into account the comorbidity, the frequency, the duration, and be really meticulous about diagnosing coexistent nasal conditions such as AR, as well as think about the child overall and other ENT conditions such as adenoidal hypertrophy and as well as OSA. Um, so going back to that, and hopefully we've covered this and you will give you some guidelines or some uh, helpful hints as to when to operate and if you should operate. Um, thank you very much. I can take any questions. That is super punctual, Nara. Thanks a million. Brilliant talk. I have to stick to time. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant talk. Um, let's see, are there any questions? So, one of the questions is Are there patient reported outcome measures you use in children pre or post surgery? Um, so uh, that's that's oops sorry forgive me um, that's that's a very very good question. We don't at the moment, and I think that's that's got more to do with resource allocation than anything else. Um, uh, we, do, we, don't, we don't have access to a, um, a, a rhinology nurse or, or a nurse specialist, but that would be, you know, that would be really, you know, very, very helpful. Um, it's, I think the most important thing is um, how, to, how to assess the impact thereafter. Yeah. Thank you. At the moment, there are no more questions, but I, we'll just give them a minute, Nara, just in case they're... Um, no, no problem. Because you were super punctual. I wonder whether they just weren't, weren't expecting it. Right, so another question is, performing sinus surgery, do you remove adenoids at the same time? So if performing sinus surgery, do you remove adenoids at the same time? So I think that's a really, really good question, and I don't have a unifying answer for that. Um, I think it's uh, what I what I do to, uh, is is when I take that history, I I will very often, in fact, almost always, will counsel them that there is a number of things that could be contributing to the symptoms, and I will say that even if we've seen good going CRS on a CT and we've made the decision for all sorts of things to, to go ahead with surgery, uh, I will outline the importance of the adenoid as well. Uh, I think there's a very good argument for doing it. I have done it at the same time, um, but I think it's the same as with um, whenever, if you're, for example, doing an OSA surgery. Um, I don't want to get into an OSA talk, but, you know, if you, um, you know, if you find that those adenoids are actually not very much to speak of, I would leave them alone. But I think it's a really good idea 
to counsel them. And one of the things I find very commonly is that there is an underlying allergic rhinitis rumbling on, uh, which is contributing to some of the symptom pictures, not causing, so it's not a, a causal connection, uh, but a symptomatic one. Um, so then I will very, very carefully counsel them to say, um, uh, look, it's, it, it's a, uh, even when we sort out one, we might be left with another. And we have had situations where uh, the, the two was going on and until we treated everything, there wasn't a huge amount of symptomatic improvement. Brilliant, Nara. The question's coming in thick and fast now. The next question is certainly related. Is adenoidectomy effective in treating CRS in selected patients? And if so, do you know who these selected patients might be? Uh, so I think the, the simple and short answer to that is no. Um, so uh, what's what seems to see, I think what seems to be, although there's no sound evidence out there, but what seems to be the case is that if you do a sound adenoidectomy in somebody who's incredibly obstructing uh, the nose, uh, then you will reduce that biofilm load. So it would be a terribly difficult study to do, uh, of course, because it would kind of depend on the degree of obstruction, etc. Um, but uh, but no, that in and of itself, uh, not 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 necessarily no. And then the next question is semi-related, I think. Do you perform FES for children who have suffered complications of ARS, of AR? Um, so, so no, no, not if it's not near, yeah, not, 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 not if it's just a straightforward, straightforward AR. No, I would, I would not do it for that. You would expect uh, that, uh, but I think a lot of that you will see on your, on your CT as well. And, you know, with the allergic rhinitics, you will see, uh, they will have a response when you treat them adequately with, with, with steroids. So no, that, that would not consider that surgical option myself. Um, another question, this, this comes from Michael Clarivi in Ireland, who's, who's one of our <coughs> paediatric rhinology and skull base surgeons. He's excellent. He's asking, Rodney Lusk concluded at the end of his career not to perform FES in children under eight due to physiologic immune maturation. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's an excellent point. Um, we know that just just the same way as you know that, that's one of the reasons why allergic pictures change in children. You know, it's not a no, it's not a a, a static uh, static process. Um, I do not undertake endoscopic sinus surgery in children under eight with joy. You know, you you know it's 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 difficult. You know, it's not going to be fun. Uh, I do avoid it without a doubt. I have had to do a few, uh, but after really careful consideration and really sort of throwing the book in them in terms of medical treatment and it not working. Uh, th this this um, this child I was mentioning being one of them. Um, you know, absolutely sinuses full of muck and and really distressed and just pouring pus the whole time despite long term antibiotics and all the other treatments. So. I, I, I was sort of forced into that, but no, it doesn't fill my heart with joy, definitely. I'm just going to rephrase the previous question I asked, that was my fault. Do you perform FES for children who have suffered complications of acute rhinosinus, rhinosinus, rhinosinus? Oh, I see, oh, I see, sorry. Oh, I thought it was AR as well. Okay, right. uh, okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, you can do, yeah, absolutely. I think if you've got, you know, if it's an acute, I think if you were saying it's a complication of acute rhinosinusitis, um, that has ongoing evidence of sinus disease, uh, then we've almost changed it from, um, from, from an acute picture to an acute that's evolved into a chronic picture. So yes, I would. Raj, Raj Balas. Sort of, definitely, but yes, I would, yeah. Right, <laughs> Raj, he likes CSF. Yes, he, he's feeling very singled out. Oh, I'm sorry. That rhinologists are comfortable being bathed in CSF. <laughs> Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you have answered this question already, but I'll ask it again. Is adenoidectomy alone enough to control CRS in children, or do you still need to do routine FES? Routine FES, I'm not sure about that, but yeah. Uh, yeah, or, or I think just, ju just FES. I, I think I was, as I was answering that, I was sort of rethinking the first one. I think what's, what the really difficult thing to say about that is if, you, if we think about, I think there's no, let me phrase it, I don't think there's a one way of answering that question. If you've got adenoids that are so obstructive that you've got a nose that cannot drain other than anteriorly and you see then a complete filling up of the sinuses uh, then I think I'm not saying I would definitely but I think there's an argument to be made for that however I think that should it, I would suggest that I would stage that and to try and say because I think endoscopic sinus surgery in kids is not something that I would undertake lightly I'd probably do the adenoids first and see where that has taken us
sorry, the, the next question now is, yeah. do you do full house fez in cystic fibrosis or polypectomy? I, I definitely do not do full house fez. These, these kids will grow into hopefully adults with CF and this will be an ongoing chronic problem that will be with them forever and a day. Um, so ripping out uh, mucosa is, is, you know, is, not, is not the way forward, I think. So, um, so no, so I will do, almost I will do the minimum that is required for, for these children. Um, so I would, uh, I would clear everything out. I do, I do an antrostomy, you know, an anterior ethmoidectomy, do their ethmoids, etc. But I would not be going chasing the sphenoids. I would not be chasing the frontals. No. Thank you. And the next question is one of my previous colleagues in Ireland, who is also lovely. What conservative management strategies, a stepladder approach, would you go through prior to surgical intervention in children? I think number one is to, that's a really good question. I think number one is to, um, to look at all the other possible contributing pathologies, whether it's adenoidal or, or allergic rhinitis uh, and optimize those. Um, I would then consider if there's optimization of any other comorbidity conditions such as CF. So I've, I, we're very lucky at, at the London, we've got a fantastic respiratory team. Uh, we've got the regional CF uh, center there as well. We don't do PCD that's localized to the Brompton, um, but we've got good relationships with them as well. So I would make sure that all of those treatment uh, options are optimized and they have had adequate medical therapy. And, and, if, and if all of that hasn't worked. So I, I would probably say I'm, I'm more on the conservative side than I'm on the trigger happy side. Fair enough, Narath. Um, right, what intranasal steroid regime do you use? Um, so I think it depends on how bad they are. I think Nasonex, Mimetazone is a good, good starting point. Um, I know that one of the previous questions for previous talks was about uh, Flixinase nasals. I've used them as well. Um, and, uh, but I would say Nasonex uh, would, be, would be the first, uh, first option. And the thing that I actually hasn't met, hadn't mentioned, but I should have done is, is um, uh, uh, we're not meant to call it douching now, uh, Esper Prof Land, we're meant to call it nasal irrigation. Um, apparently the French objected. So um, I, I, I think irrigation is fantastic, actually. And some kids get, it's, it's really amazing, some kids get on with that brilliantly, and others will just, it's a flat out no, it's a bit like the Otovent balloon, you know. Um, so yes, I, I'm a great enthusiast for irrigation. And then what age do you recommend or accept for endoscopic subperiosteal abscess decompression rather than an external approach? I don't know if I've got an absolute answer for that. Um, I think I think it, you know, that needs enough room in the nose for you to, to do an endoscopic approach, even with maximum decongestion. Um, I think the youngest we have done, I have to think now, was probably about four or five. And that was a struggle. So possible, but uh, yeah. I think that's just anecdotal as to what we've done. Did we enjoy it? Not so much. And I think that's it, Nora. Thank you for a really excellent talk. Thank you very much. That's a pleasure.